I guess I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Elijah Insulko, and some people know me as Templar. I'm on IRC, uh, Templar.com, pretty much everywhere you look, I'll be Templar, so you can find me there. Um, I'm a minimalist who enjoys breaking complex problems into manageable pieces that can be dealt with easily. Um, currently a developer at Arc90, a web consulting firm in New York City, and I'm coming from you, or coming to you from Brooklyn live. <laughs> Um, today I'd like to talk to you about a project I've been working on it's called JS DOM. Um, JS DOM is a common, J, common JS implementation of the W3C DOM specification, which is intended to be standards compliant and platform independent. Um, before, it's, before I start, I'd like to say it's, it's going to be really difficult to follow Ryan, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I love Node and I love the direction and in which it's going. Um, all right. So today I'd like to talk about why I started this project and what what you can do with it now. Um, I'll show you some simple examples on uh, to demonstrate some of the benefits of having a lightweight DOM on the server. I'll finish by explaining where the JS DOM currently is and where I'd like to see it go. But first, let's start with what sort of crazy person would want to do this. Um, I'll start by saying I have a love-hate relationship with the DOM. Um, on one hand, according to Olo, which I know is a, a great source, there's been something like 74 man years spent on developing the DOM specifications and tests. Um, this is a really low estimate, though, when you think about it, because the spec and test writers did not just sit down and just you know start writing the test. They you know sat around and they developed this over the course of a long period of time. These guys are smart. Took them, took them a long time, and due to their due diligence, the DOM provides a consistent low-level API for working with tree structure. The problem, however, and this is the, the hate portion of this, um, is that browsers, browser makers actually, give the DOM a terrible name by making it gener generally painful to use. Um, they've, been no, they've been known to ignore specifications and innovate behind closed doors. There, there are tons of other browser-related issues, um, but uh, I don't want to really go down that rabbit hole tonight. <laughs> so as a developer, I, I really hate writing the same code twice. Um, reusable code makes development faster. It allows developers to focus on real problems as opposed to yak shading. Uh, when, there, when there's a way to make templates reusable on the server, uh, and the browser, life will be good. And I'm here to report that life is now good. Uh, Node.js and a server-sided DOM, such as JS DOM, uh, make both code reuse and template reuse possible. Um, and while it's nice to use cutting-edge br browser features, unfortunately, the reality of the situation is that we as developers need to provide our clients with real value. Uh, this means providing uh, means for accessibility for older browsers and not A-grade browsers, as well as SEO. Um, it's a pain, but we have to do it. Um, and on a side note, I'd like to mention automated testing. Um, right now, my main focus is not to get automated testing working. Um, if, I mean, if you want to do that, you can go with HTML unit, test swarm, Selenium, or any of these other things that were built primarily for um, automated testing. Um, all I want to do with JS DOM is provide a very simple, uh, thin, standards compliant DOM that runs on the server. Okay, so I'll start with reusable code. There are many great uh, libraries that use the DOM currently. Um, getting some of these to run on Node.js is really not that far off. And it would be really great if you could use you know, the same library that you know and love on the browser, on the server. I think it would cut down a lot of time. Um, bringing these to the server is a very important step in reusing code. Reusable templates. Um, when I started writing JS DOM, I saw it as the first step to creating a non-destructive or dual-side templating system that keeps logic out of the templates. Um, the majority of template systems that I use or have seen even are destructive. Um, what I mean by this is they manipulate the text as opposed to 
uh, like a DOM structure. Um, and I'm going to show why this is the structure. Um, CSS selectors uh, make this job easier, right? So you can select the DOM element and it makes it a lot easier to find and manipulate the DOM. Um, all right. <laughs> so I'm going to take a moment and explain what I mean by destructive templating. Uh, PHP gives us a great example of destructive templating. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with PHP, echo hello world simply outputs hello world, and the result is pushed to the browser. And at which point, uh, the HTML is static. Uh, the only way to get back to, make, or to make this page dynamic is to you know, write some jQuery code or some, some browser-based, uh, some JavaScript, right? Um, and that, that's not good. Uh, not only are you context shifting um, between PHP and JavaScript, but it's, you have to write the, the code twice, which is a problem. Um, I'd also like to mention here that it's not only PHP that has this flaw. It's um, a ton of server-sided languages like Ruby, Python, or any other like templating engine or language that does text replacement as opposed to DOM manipulation. Um, this is a real hindrance to achieving like any sort of efficiency. Uh, because once you strip out the logic that generated the template in the first place, you write more code to make up for it. Uh, this becomes unmanageable because you have to write very similar code multiple times. And just to add on to this, <clears throat> uh, most of the designers that I've worked with, they avoid touching templates with embedded code. I mean, if they had a choice, they probably wouldn't. I mean, there are exceptions, but in reality, they shouldn't have to be touching logic. That should be a uh, developer's job. We can do better than this. Um, we should be able to let designers do what they're, do what they're good at. Let them build compelling experience for the web without having to worry about how it works. So, introducing reusable templates. Um, using DOM manipulations with CSS selectors solves this problem. Um, this example is done with Pure, Beeple's, or Beeple's Peer. Um, so, instead of doing direct text uh, manipulation, as with the PHP example, you use CSS selectors to find uh, containers in the content, and then you can modify um, modify the text. Okay, so the way that the way that uh, Pure works is you define basically the glue uh, between your data and your DOM, which uh, Pure calls a directive. It actually defines it as uh, directives are actions that you will perform on the template, or something like that. Um, so basically, C using CSS selectors, the render method takes the incoming data and applies it to the appropriate places on the DOM. So it uses DOM manipulation, which is really important. It basically jumps over all of these text replacement issues. Um, Okay, so this is the same code, this is a kind of minimal example of the same directive being used in the browser after it's been sent from uh, the pure implementation on the server. Um, at this point, you can use jQuery to pull new data and update the H1 or, you know, various other things. This is very minimal and, you know, there are many, many benefits to be had by doing it this way. Okay, so I need to talk a little bit about progression enhancement. Um, generating HTML on the server has some great advantages over re rendering everything client side for a couple of reasons. Uh, from what I understand, currently, uh, spiders do not process JavaScript or Ajax, uh, although that's, that's changing. Uh, generally, you know, it just reads links and follows them, blah, blah, blah. Um, that, that will change, I guess, uh, eventually. But for now, we still need to send out these, you know, text-only pages. Um, providing, providing compatibility for older browsers and text browsers, which is important. Um, 
and also enhancing a user's experience over slow internet connections, which we're seeing a lot of that with mobile. And I, I know a couple people uh, that have dial-up, but it's very rare these days. Um, <laughs> so the idea of sending the browser a minimal but functional HTML page is attractive because it, you can delegate the feature detection to the browser, which is pretty important for, it's, it's a, it's especially, ugh, especially important for non-A-grade browsers, right? So the current implementation of GSDOM. Um, we are currently at version 01, which I guess is kind of scary, but it is working. Um, it passes all of the DOM level one or W3C tasks, which there are 1,300 of. Um, in an effort to keep this minimal, I have, I'm shipping this without a parser. Um, Dave Glass actually added, added support for Node HTML parser, which it will actually warn you if you're not using it. I don't know if that will stay there, but uh, I've also done an implementation with Saks.js. Um, we also have some, some browser augmentation. So in order to get um, some of these things like Sizzle or jQuery or any, any of these things running on the DOM, we have to provide methods like window.owner, window.cell, location, and all these other things. Get load, get elements by class name, not by ID. Um, if you use Node HTML parser, jump it between back there real quick, sorry. <laughs> um, inner and HTML, inner and outer HTML will just work, um, which is nice. Okay. So in the future, I'd like to implement uh, DOM level one HTML elements, or, you know, like, uh, yeah, just basic HTML elements, like keys and uh, divs and all this other thing, all this other stuff. Um, but currently there are no tests. Uh, basically, when I, wrote the, when I wrote the DOM initially, when I wrote JS DOM initially, I pulled, I, I basically pulled all of the, the tests from a test suite that they had written and just went from there. So it was perfectly easy. I knew exactly the direction that I had to go. I knew exactly what I needed to do to make this absolutely standard to comply. Right now, I would have to write about the same amount of code and also the test. So it's about double the effort, but minimal gain to in regards to like templating and non-destructive templating. It's not impossible, but a huge pain in the ass. Um, I'd also like to fix some implementation issues, namely scoping issues. Um, I, I, I get into an argument with my coworker saying, uh, you know, it, it's not that important, you know, like if you if you do like a dot underscore, that should be private and, you know, all these other things. But honestly, I believe that, you know, private variables should be private. <laughs> There's also optimizations, uh, refactoring, documentation that needs to be written and finished. Um, I'd also like to write more DOM level. Uh, DOM level 2 especially, because then we get namespaces and level 2 events, which the majority of browser, well, I mean, the majority of uh, complete uh, browser libraries, you know, use these. Um, and it would be great to run all those on so in conclusion, um, thank you for your time. You can find more info about JSDOM on JSDOM.org. And here are some of the some links to the other libraries that I mentioned. Do we have any questions? I mean, can I even take questions? Yes, you can. Can you hear us? Yes. Perfect. Then you can hear the questions that are about to come your way. Awesome. So um, great, you sold me. Um, but I'd like to understand. If I have a completely empty JavaScript environment that, you know, let's say I downloaded V8 or I downloaded Rhino and I set up a context, what are all the things I need to do inside of it, or at least just a summary of, in order to get the server-side DOM running? Um, well, it's it's pretty easy. <laughs> uh, it's common JS based, so you have to require. Uh, right now, it's uh, let's see here. 
there's a path something like JS DOM slash live slash level one for JS. I basically split all of these apart. So, you know, we have level one, four, we can go, you know, level two, four, and blah, blah, blah. And you can use them ideally independently. You know, if you don't need all of this namespacing and events, you can go down to the core. So basically, uh, back to what I was saying, you, you would require in core, and at that point, you could pragmatically build the DOM if you wanted. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. It looks like uh, we don't, we have more questions right here. Uh, currently, CommonJS uh, only requires uh, ECMAScript 3, and ECMAScript 3, uh, you can't express in JavaScript many of the magical properties that DOM nodes have. Uh, for example, you mentioned innerHTML. You can't do innerHTML in ECMAScript 3 because ECMAScript 3 doesn't have getters and setters. Um, uh, once CommonJS moves to ECMAScript 5, most of these problems go away. So I'm curious what, what you do in the meantime. Um, V8 actually has support for um, getters and setters, which is nice. Uh, there were other gaps, however, in, in the functionality that I had to work around, such as the live node list. Um, but, I mean, that was, that was not horrible. I, I don't I don't know if I can answer that question correctly. I mean, it's not I'm not sure of what the state or where V8 actually is as far as its uh, ECMAScript uh, you know version or whatever. Uh, I, I mean, I can I can fill you in on that. But the, the the interesting thing about your answer is it says that you're not only dependent on standard CommonJS. You're also using uh, further features since ES3 that are available on specifically. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, so so you've only been running this on V8 as opposed to other uh, platforms? Yeah, this this runs currently on Norwal. I've, I've heard of it running on Norwal, and it runs on Node, okay. which uses V8, so yes. Great, and thanks. More questions? Right. Looks like we're uh, we're out of questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>